I can guarantee you've never seen one of these before, but then hardly anybody has. This is a Livin's flame projector, one of the most terrifying and bizarre weapons of the First World War. We're excavating the British front line as it was on the eve of the Battle of the Somme in 1916. And what's more, we think one of these may be down there. A team of experts has gathered in northern France for a special expedition. I can see a bit of metal. Oh, wow! They've come to find a secret tunnel used in the bloodiest battle of World War I. Maybe there is something in the belly of the beast. Recover a forgotten weapon of terror trapped inside it. Voilà. That's it, that's it. And with the help of the British Royal Engineers... Good to go when you are. ..rebuild it. It was designed to instill the most horrific terror. Thanks. Historian Peter Barton has come to northern France to lead a special excavation. Peter, Gentlemen, how, how are, are you? Peter? Doing well. He's joined by archaeologists Tony Pollard. And Ian Banks. So we've got so a real job of detective work on our hands then to we're nail that. They've got just 15 days to locate and excavate a top secret tunnel hidden somewhere in this field. Finding these tunnels will be a real challenge, but if we succeed, it'll throw a whole new light on one of the most famous battles in our history. Mamey is a small farming village 150 kilometers north of Paris. Nearly a century ago, this sleepy community found itself at the center of World War I. In 1914, the German army is stopped just north of here as it races towards Paris. The armies dig in, and the infamous trenches of the Western Front are born. After two years of bitter fighting, on July the 1st, 1916, the Allies launch a massive attack that ran right through this field. The goal, shatter the German line and finally end the war. It would be known as the Battle of the Somme. Along much of this 25 kilometer front, the attack is a catastrophic failure. The German line holds, and in just 24 hours, 60,000 men are killed or wounded. Some of those men never even saw the enemy at all. Many of them never got over their own parapet. They were cut down as they came up out of the trenches. But in this field near Mamey, something very different happened. Here, the Allies took the German line. Peter's recently discovered a top secret Allied plan that may help explain this success. He's learned that in the weeks before the attack, the Allies dug dozens of tunnels that led right to the German lines. Let's be frank, there must be 10,000 books written about the Somme. Is there anything new that we can learn here? Well, we're telling a story uh, which has never been told before. We're looking for what are called saps. And what they were was shallow tunnels going from your position, underneath no man's land, to the enemy position. Peter's now come to find one that runs beneath this very field. Called Sap 14, it stretched from the British front line to the very edge of the German trenches. It contained explosives that could shatter German defences. A secret hatch that delivered troops straight into the enemy line. And the largest flamethrower used in the war, a two-ton, 60-foot monster. If this is so secret, how do you know about it? It's only my interest in this engineering side, which is what people don't concentrate on, that I came across this. And it's, uh, it's there in the war diaries. Peter discovered this scheme while reading the Royal Engineers' war diaries, records of their actions during the fighting. To learn more about these saps, Peter hopes to find and explore the one in this field. We need to get into these things to see what evidence we can find inside. You know, if they do really go across no man's land, do we know whether these plans are complete or not? So the only way we can do that is an archaeological excavation. 
To get in, Peter's put together a team of bomb disposal specialists, archaeologists and royal engineers. Um, yeah, first of all, I'd like to say how good it is to have so many people with a great expertise involved in this project. Um, Gary Andrews reminds them of the dangers of digging here. There is always the potential for munitions of some description. Um, there's, a, there's a high probability of finding these things. Thousands of World War I munitions remain hidden in these fields. Such a variety. Many are still live and could explode if disturbed. Just getting worried that this is going to turn into an exercise in bomb disposal rather than archaeology. <laughs> Every year, the French bomb squad removes tons of shells from this region. Wouldn't have a clue. Um, Over 600 of them have been killed in the line of duty. Yeah. Sobering. Uh, radar, so... But shells aren't the only challenge this team's facing. It'll be challenging. After the fighting stopped, the trenches were backfilled by farmers. And after almost a century, few traces of the war are still visible. But they've got one strong lead, a map made by the men who built this tunnel. You have here British front line in black, coming through, mm -hmm. German front line in blue, and all this area here is within this bare field behind us. In 1916, the German front line snaked through this very field. The Allies were dug in 120 metres south, and just behind their front line, the two entrances to our sap. And this is it here. You've got the sap in the orange and the, and the pink. There we are, shallow sap, two entrances, down to a small chamber, and then it heads out, crosses under the British trench into no man's land. If you can find the trenches, then we should be able to find the entrances. And how are we going to do that, Dr. Banks? Well, I would have thought geophysics would be the answer here. I thought you might say that. Yes. With the help of some high-tech gear, the team hopes to get a glimpse of what's happening beneath their feet. Backtech, world leaders in finding and removing landmines, have come on board to help. Their state-of-the-art equipment should pick up traces of the trenches and sap. You seemed pretty confident that we'd be able to pick up some good geophys. How's it gone? We've geophysicked this area here. One of the really intriguing things, and it's actually surprised me, is we've got the sap running through behind the British frontline trench towards the German, German trenches. We don't know what depth it is, but I think we're picking it up on the geophysics. Can you see this line coming through? Oh, yeah, so you think that that is, is exactly. That. Yeah. And the interesting Shikaji. thing is that it's, we've got this angle you see that? The front line here appears to be angled. Yeah. And we have an angle on the front line. It's not as acute oh, on this. Oh, it's just tiny, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. that's it. Yeah. That's it. So there does appear to be a correlation between our mapping and all of our geophysics, which I'm, I'm very pleased with. Now they'll open up a large section of the field and search for key stretches of trench. We bring in a machine. We take down maybe the top 20 or 30 centimetres. There should be a difference in the type of soil, in the colour of soil and the surrounding subsoil. But if we can't see that, we're in real trouble. With the first layer of soil removed, there's no sign of the British trenches. Teams caught a break. Fantastic. They're running off. Farmers backfilled this trench with chalk, a white rock common throughout the region. If they're all like this, if they're all stuffed full of chalk. Yeah. Should be easy to find. You should do it's, this for a living. It's like a neon sign. <laughs> I'm trying. Wow. Fantastic. They've definitely found a World War I trench. But to see if it leads to our sap you will have to open up more of this field. As more of the topsoil's removed, the team starts to find remnants of the war. Lucky us. We've got uh, a clip of bullets from uh, 303. 
but that's just come out of somebody's ammunition pouch. But two of them are still joined together by the charger. Quite a find. This trench feels like it's got a million different stories to tell, and we're only on the surface. But what I'm enjoying so much are all the little finds that are coming up. Cheeseborough, New York, Vaseline. Wow. It's been fairly heavily used. It has, hasn't it? That's nice. During the war, Vaseline was used to maintain weapons and to treat cuts and scrapes. And you can actually see the Vaseline in it. And if you look closely, there are actually fingerprints in there from the guys who've uh, applied the, the Vaseline. But this one over here is quite incredible. What we've got is uh, a rum jar. On the side of it, we've got the letters SRD, which stands for Service Ration Depot. Uh, a lot of the times, the soldiers would say that uh, it was uh, seldom reaches destination. It would have been full of rum and was a wee bit of comfort to the, the guys in the cold in the trenches. There's another bullet there and a great lot of them here. But my favourite find of all so far is this. It's a coin and it appears as though it's been hit by a bullet. Now, it seems hard to believe, but that may have been a coin that was in somebody's pocket. Yeah. Now, I wonder if that helped to deflect a bullet for good or bad. Got to see, it doesn't look good. This yeah. is pretty astounding, actually. Yeah. With the hunt for the trenches off to a great start, Peter kicks off the search for one of the most secret and terrifying weapons of the First World War. Peter, let's be optimistic for a moment. Let us suppose that they get inside, they're in SAP 14, as you step forward, like the archaeologists when they first saw the tomb of Tutankhamun, they found golden chariots. What are we going to find? I would like to find the most unusual weapon in the war. It's a weapon of terror. The best thing to do is show you an image of it. Whoa! It looks absolutely lethal. It's called a Livens Large Gallery Flame Projector. It is 56 feet long, it's 14 inches wide, it had a seven-man crew, and it weighed two and a half tonnes. This looks incredibly vulnerable. It looks like any shell would be able to blow all this up straight away. That's, that's a, a very good observation, because this, believe it or not, was used from a tunnel, and that's precisely why we're here. So how might that work? Well, you build it inside your tunnel. When you pressurise the machine, the firing head, which was called the monitor, pushes itself through the surface like a dragon and starts firing automatically. And it fires a jet of burning oil 100 metres long. 100 metres? Why do you think there's one here? Well, the war diaries tell us that in this sector, they were going to deploy one of these machines from a tunnel in no man's land here. The diaries say that in the early hours of June the 28th, 1916, 200 soldiers hauled the pieces of the projector into the sap. But before it could be assembled, a shell struck, burying the parts in the tunnel beyond recall. If his theory is correct, the projector is trapped somewhere within this sap. If we can find the parts of this, if they are still there in sap 14, that is my Tutankhamun moment. But Peter's quest to get underground and recover the projector has just hit its first roadblock. You've got shapes here, this shape coming through here. That's definitely Phil, that's possibly the edge of it. What is that? We've had no indication of this thing continuing on. But it's here, somewhere. Despite a great start... Hold on. ...they're having real trouble finding the trenches that led to our sap. It's a disappointment. A short setback. Let's get it the right way around. That one is okay. That's closer. That one's the funny one. I would, I would love to see something and go, aha! I know where I am now. Not all the trenches were backfilled with chalk, and the team's finding it very difficult to pick them out of the clay. I don't think it's this one. But... Lovely. Bloody hell! I think at the moment we're floating. We're floating because we don't have these reference points. We've got sections of trench that we think we know where they lie on the map. But until we see what their association with it, it with the frontline trenches, we're really making assumptions. 
With just 11 days of digging left and no sign of the sap, Peter's dream of finding the flame projector is in real jeopardy. Four days into the excavation and the team struggling to find their way. Once it starts getting a bit... As the hunt to find the sap and flamethrower continues, I check in with a frustrated Tony. Tony, this trench is the size of St Paul's Cathedral. And getting bigger, yeah. The thing is, we tried before doing keyhole trenches and you just can't tell what's happening. Yeah. You've got trenches going all over the place. You need to be able to see an expanse of this area. Tony decides their best hope of getting their bearings is to expand the dig site and hunt for the front-line trench. It's an anxious time for the team. They must face the fact that they're lost, or even worse, that the map is wrong. Oh, Tony. Finally, they spot something beneath the topsoil. That's more like it. Fantastic. You see this colour change? Oh, yeah. Really Very nice clean. and straight all the way along into the bolt there. And this looks like it's the back of the front line trench. With the discovery of the front line, the dig's back on track. Now they must find the trench that leads to our sap. But the team has another reason to celebrate. The hunt for the sap has uncovered something unseen for almost a century. That's frontline sandbags. That's fantastic. Just astonishing. It's quite nice the way that they actually survive in the ground. You just uh, peel away the, the clay off the top and it leaves that, and that's been sitting there for 90 years. What we've got to realise here, that these are 1st of July sandbags. These are the trenches which those men climbed out on the 1st of July. That's quite moving, isn't it, really? It is. Yeah. Good thing you got the Ice by Sandbag book. Yeah, it's a very good thing. I live by that. <laughs> I have one under my pillow. <laughs> As the team continues to get their bearings, I go with Peter to learn why a sap would be so important on a World War I battlefield. So the whistle's gone, we've gone over the top. We're on our way through no man's land. We're heading towards the German lines over there. What's happening? Well, you've gone through your own barbed wire entanglements. Now you've got to make a line, form a line, so you arrive there all at the same time. We are now in the killing zone, and they want to kill us. So now you are faced with machine guns firing 450 rounds a minute. You're faced with snipers, you're faced with infantry, with with small arms, so you're in the teeth of the gale, if you like, and you're being shelled with shrapnel. For two long years, these tactics were used in battle after battle. Thousands of Allied troops were cut down trying to cross the killing fields of no man's land. You can really understand, can't you, why people would have wanted there to be tunnels underneath no man's land, why they would have wanted not only their infantry to be protected in that way, but to get up some more armaments to protect those who were walking in this dreadful, slow way. That's absolutely right. The sole purpose of these weapons which were put in places the Germans were not expecting, in the tunnels, the mortars, the machine guns, the flamethrowers, the mines, that was solely to help those infantrymen get across no man's land with the minimal number of casualties. Back at the dig site, the teams made another breakthrough. Thankfully, after we've pushed back across the frontline trench, I can now happily say I know exactly where I am, and I'm standing just on that corner there. This is the front line trench. Running off this portion of the front line is this trench running through here. It runs through in a series of angles, and if I walk in this direction, I'm walking down to this angle, turn this slight bend down here, and then the angle changes again, and that brings me to here, where this piece of wood is, and that may well mark the entrance into the sap. The team's convinced they found a trench that leads to our sap. Their quest to get underground and find the flame projector just took a major step forward. 
They believe the trench leads to an incline, a staircase carved from the side of the trench down to the sap. From the war diaries, they know there are two, the western and the eastern incline. As the hunt to get underground begins, I check back in with Tony. If you look on the trench map here, yeah. this is the eastern entrance to the incline. So and this is it? This is it. This is it. So this is really the significant part of the whole of the dig? It is. That's the good news. Yeah. The bad news is that we know from the war diaries that this was blown up by a German shell in July 1916. So it's completely wrecked and we can't get in. That's what you're going to tell me, isn't it? Yeah. You, you can see we've, we've got structural timbers here that are damaged. And all along, I've been hoping that if this is gone, which the war diary suggested, yeah. the opposite entrance, the western entrance, will be well preserved. And so we've still got fingers crossed on that. From the war diaries, they know that the two entrances are 32 metres apart. With the eastern incline found, the hunt for its western counterpart can begin. They hope that following the war, the western incline was simply blocked when the farmers filled in the trenches. If they can clear it out, they might get in. Taken on the Somme in 1916, Peter believes this rare photo may show the very entrance we're hunting. This doorway and the sap it led to were made by an elite group of Royal Engineers, the Tunnelers. Drawn from Britain, Canada and Australia, these men conducted a secret war far beneath the battlefield. While much of their work was shrouded in secrecy, Peter's learned that our sap was driven by the 183 Tunnelling Company. Sent to the Somme in October 1915, they had orders to stop German tunnellers from reaching Allied front lines. You fight him underground with controlled explosions. You try to either obliterate him or entomb him in his tunnel by blowing the tunnel in with an explosion you plant underground. So that was the kind of war that was going on, and it was a, it was a real hot spot here. After almost five months of bitter fighting, the 183 are given a new assignment. Drive a sap to the edge of the German lines. At the western edge of the site, the team thinks it's finally found evidence of their work. What is it you think you've got, Tom? I think it's the western entrance to the incline. Ah, the, the eastern one there was closed off, but this is the one that could be open? Exactly, and as you can see, the structure to it, there are frames, there's this corrugated iron, which may have been the roof. So what are you going to do? We've got to go down here, see what that is, see whether it is the right kind of timber to go across, and then see whether we can get in there. I don't want to jump too far ahead, but if you can get in here, you could access some really interesting stuff, couldn't you? If yeah. we could get into there, it would be an opportunity of a lifetime, literally. There's a lot of nerve-wracking between now and then. <laughs> While Tony and Ian get cracking on getting into the sap, Peter starts to excavate the eastern incline. It may not get them underground, but it could be the key to finding something else. 183 Tunnelling Company War Diary says that at 6am on the 28th of June 1916, a shell fell on the tunnel in which the flame projector was stored. Peter thinks this shell entombed the machine in the incline and that it's down there still. Although it never got there, it was supposed to be fired from this specially carved spur of the sap. That's it, so you need... He's taped it out in no man's land to show us where it would have been fired. What? Yep. So, you can see how far we are from the British line. It's pretty well where the fence was. So they've driven that in a few months and that's where it came up. So what you've got here is, what, about 60 metres to the German line. So when it's pressurised, up it comes, pushes through the earth, pushes through the roots to about that height, turns towards the target and then starts firing its jet of burning oil. The projector held enough fuel for three 10-second blasts. In just half a minute, it could burn through over 1,300 litres, enough to power most cars for half a year today. It generated a terrifying wall of flame that could incinerate almost 100 metres of trench. Not all of it had burned by the time it reached the trenches, so it landed in the trenches and continued to burn. So you pretty well neutralised that section of line. As day six comes to an end, 
I check in with the team at the western entrance. Here is where I thought the entrance of Sab 14 was going to be, which everyone was so excited about yesterday that they were going to excavate first thing this morning. And it's 20 past five, and there's no work done on this at all. Well, What's there, going on? There is. We, we've been hard at work on it. The problem is it's not the entrance to Sab 14. Oh, you're kidding. Um, I wish I was. Um, the problem is that this looks like it's just stuff thrown into the top of the fill of a trench. So if the entrance isn't here, where is it? It's somewhere in this area. It's around here close, but this just is not it here. At the moment, it's a bit of an archaeological mess, isn't it? Yeah, I prefer the term puzzle. Thank you, Tony. An archaeological puzzle. Not a mess. It's a puzzle. It's a mess, really. While finding our sap has proved more difficult than we'd hoped, the finds are giving us a unique look at the life of a First World War soldier. Three of my most favourites. There's this glass bottle made in Glasgow for Baird's Pickle, although I've no idea what Baird's Pickle tasted like. There's this toothbrush. What we found is a, a toothbrush. Look at that colour still on that marble. It's so bright orange, isn't it? Not very much brush, but look at that patterning on the back of it. Isn't that absolutely lovely? There might be some markings on there. L O N London. 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 That's tremendous. Well found, Jim. Yeah. And the creme de la creme, this blue enamel water bottle. I just think that is exquisite. The finds are piling up, and they're painting a picture of the evolution of these trenches. A French Lebel cartridge case, which indicates the people who occupied these trenches before the British arrived. This is a French bayonet, and this was found in the bottom of a, an old French trench, along with several French knapsacks. So that's quite nice, but a very nasty weapon. The British took control of this sector in 1915, but the French army dug many of these trenches the previous year. In 1914, they made a bloody stand in these very fields. Thousands were cut down, trying to push the Germans out of France. The team think they've found grim evidence of this fight. It's one discovery they hoped they wouldn't make. Got a body. There's just a bit of pelvis. Yeah. Um, Material. Like other bone. Yeah, yeah. It's fabric from clothing. Mm -hmm. I suspect his trousers. Yeah, just a as soon as you make direct contact with human remains, your sensitivities change completely. My heart is now racing, shivering, shaking, and it's just that total shock of impact. With the authorities informed, Tony begins the painstaking process of carefully exhuming the body. This is a soldier who lost his life and we shall record in every due respect. But as work continues, he makes another discovery. We've now got two bodies. This chap here, he's been wrapped in his coat, but the buttons on his coat are different from the one that you've got, which is the standard grenade yeah, design. Yeah, that's a grenade on. That's which the is, regular arm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. These are anchors and chains. Ah, oh, right, yeah. And that means something very different. These are colonial troops. This chap is out of France. He may have been French Foreign Legion, he may be Marines or even Senegalese. So this, this could have been a black soldier. Yeah. So we have French regular army here, we have colonial, possibly black Senegalese here. We do know that in this sector in 1914, early 15, before the British came, that there were colonial troops here. Yeah, Senegalese could have been here. French Foreign Legion was certainly here. Here we've got another single flash of a moment in time during that war. And while they'll never know who these men were, at least they'll finally be given a proper burial. Two of the missing have been found. With the soldiers safely removed, the team resumes the hunt for the sap and flamethrower. They're looking for the western incline, the staircase that leads to our sap. With the clock ticking, they decide to bring in some extra muscle. Instead of hunting for traces on the surface, they plan to dig down and find it underground. 
My blood's up now, PB. Mind. <laughs> the game is afoot. Okay. In 1916, the men who dug this incline had to do it the hard way. Every centimetre was hacked out and hauled to the surface by hand. These people were used to digging. That's what they did for a living. They came from mining backgrounds, you know. They came from uh, coal mines, quarries, that kind of thing. So they had the skill in their hands and their heads before they actually arrived here. As they went down, they used heavy timber and corrugated tin to keep the structure from collapsing. Back at the western incline, the teams found Lots metal. Big fuse. But it's definitely not the work of the 183. Artillery shells were the ultimate killer of the First World War. It's estimated they caused roughly two-thirds of all casualties. After a century in the ground, this one's still lethal. Yeah. What do you reckon it is, Gary? Is it, is it gas? No, we, we uh, first thought where it may have been gas, but now we've found out that it's HE, high explosive. Right. It's quite a big shell. If this is HE, the size of that thing, it's, if that goes off, it's going to take exactly. out the entire site anyway. Yes. Yeah. With that in position as it is now, nothing else can work on this particular site at the moment. Yeah. Don't we? <laughs> With the dig shut down until the shell can be safely removed, I go with Peter to explore the old German front line. After almost nine decades, the trenches are still visible. It really is quite extraordinary. All the time that we've been here, we've been working, what, about 200 metres from here, and yet this is the first time that I've been here to the German trenches. Why is this trench system so wiggly? Well, that's, that's to stop blast going straight down the trench. If it was straight and a shell landed in it, the blast would go straight down and kill everybody. If a shell lands over there, the blast won't come around a corner. But the key defence here is beneath your feet. They're called dugouts. And about 20 feet down, you would find chambers in which 12 or 15 men would live with their weapons, and that's the key. They live deep underground with their weapons. But how did they survive? We're lobbing shells night after night, thousands of them. Why didn't they all just die here? They were deep underground. Our shells were bursting on the surface. This place was literally erupting with explosions. But the Germans underground were perfectly safe. And when the shelling had stopped? They bring up their machine guns, they put it in the ruins of their trenches, and they cut down the British troops like corn. This scene was played out with sickening regularity during the first two years of the war. These dugouts were impervious to Allied shells, but they had an Achilles heel, attack from below. The 183 wanted to exploit this weakness. By mid-May, they were halfway to their goal, but the most dangerous part of the plan was still to come. Reach the German line and place a large charge of explosives beneath their dugouts. Back at the Western Incline, the hunt for some sign of the 183's work continues. With the shells safely removed by the French bomb squad, we've got the green light to resume working. After digging a very large hole, the team's luck seems to have finally changed. They've found clear evidence of the incline. Nails. It's definitely stepping down, so... The signs are good, but more digging to be done, right? Peter now hopes that the structure should be just beneath their feet. 4.6 metres. This is uh, a bit concerning, this. It's gone. It's gone. That's the bottom. Yeah. And they've taken the timber out of the incline. That presents big problems. Very big problems. Yeah, the timber in the incline has been salvaged. Peter believes the timber was stripped by the tunnelers and reused elsewhere on the front. Without the support, the tunnel couldn't bear the weight of the clay, and over time it caved in. Timber from at least this gallery here has been salvaged, and the worry is that they may have salvaged the timber along the whole system. With over a third of the dig completed and still no sign of the inclines, 
their dream of finding the largest flamethrower ever used in battle may be over. With just seven days of digging left, the team's starting to feel the pressure. But while getting underground is proving more difficult than we'd hoped, at the eastern incline, the hunt for the flamethrowers heating up. I'm sure I've seen this before. Yeah. Let's have a look. Steady, Commander. Voila. That's it, that's it. There we are. They've dropped the toolkit. Part number 323. The Libbins Cramps Banner. Wow, this is exciting. The team's made a major find. The toolkit used to assemble the flame projector. Wait a minute. Here they are, Tony. Look. Yeah. All laid out along the ground. Dozens of them. These tools would have been used by a seven-man crew to assemble the parts of the projector once they'd been hauled into the sap. But that's not all they've found. Yeah, there's clamps here. That's what? Clamps. Oh, it's the clamps. To make sure that it could be quickly moved into a cramped tunnel, the machine was made up of hundreds of parts. Once underground, these sections were then attached with clamps. Number 31, that's a monitor clamp with screw. I'm stunned. <laughs> Peter believes this clamp was used to hold the firing head in place. Finally, they found concrete proof that the projector was left in the sap. Champagne's on you tonight. <laughs> I'm happy to buy it. Super. Wow. With this find, the team's convinced that more of the projector could be hidden just beneath their feet. Lovely. As the hunt for more of the projector continues, I head off in search of Tony and Ian. Yeah. Whoa! Hang on. Hang on a minute. Have you seen how far away you are from the dig? Are you yeah. striking out on your own, you two? We're just, we're yeah. just having a little peace and quiet. No, <laughs> we're discussing a potential to be frank, plan B. Why do we need a plan B? We're having trouble with the inclines up there, gaining access into the sap. Mm -hmm. We thought we might be able to get in further down. So you've come out here into no man's land? Well, we've got on the geophysics what looks like the sap coming down the hill. Ian's yeah. got it on this plot here. What so does that show you? Well, what we're seeing is a line here of uh, anomalies. And what we believe is that because there's nothing else showing out here, that this must be the sap. So what exactly do you want to do? I'm hoping that these metal anomalies are possibly the corrugated iron roof and basically break, break through the roof. Is it fair to say that this is a bit of a policy of desperation? Uh, why do you think we're not talking to anybody <laughs> else about this? <laughs> we're way down here and they're all up there and they don't know we're here. The team's now going to bring the digger to the bottom of the hill to see if they can crack into the sap from above. As the hunt for the sap gets underway, I meet with Peter to learn more about these secret tunnels. Was there only one of these saps, or a lot? No, it's an entire scheme of them, all the way up the battlefront, south to north. 48 different schemes. Through the war diaries, Peter's put together a picture of Allied tunnelling plans. Starting in February 1916, dozens of saps were driven along this 25-kilometre front. In the north, most were used to relay messages. But in the south, they were flagged for far deadlier purposes. Down here in the south, they used them with imagination and ingenuity. In the north, they were simply used for communication. That's how they planned it. These southern saps contained explosives designed to shatter German dugouts, secret hatches that opened near enemy lines, and in some cases, massive flamethrowers. Do you think it was because the commanders in the north just didn't buy into the idea in the same way that they did in the south? That seems to have been the case, yeah. Down here, the commanders seem to approach the problem of crossing no man's land with ingenuity and application. Peter believes this scheme was largely the work of one man, Royal Engineer Horace Hickling. No doubt about it, he was the great tunneler of the First World War because of his vision. If things happen where you don't expect them to, 
then you're in trouble straight away. And that's what they wanted to achieve here. That's what Hickling was aiming for, to surprise the Germans, to shock them. When fighting broke out, Hickling was already a skilled mining engineer. Within months, he found himself at the forefront of a new and terrifying type of war. He was known as the live spark. He was constantly on the offensive. And he made such an impression on his commanding officer that he was very quickly promoted. And he was given command of his own company here, 183 Tunneling Company. In the spring of 1916, Hickling's unit began to dig saps running through the southern sector of the front. The work was difficult, and they were not alone underground. From dozens of tunnels, the Germans hunted the men of 183. The perils of underground fighting are multiple. You can be entombed. The enemy can blow your tunnel in, and you're stuck in this tiny tunnel. And you'll just run out of there, and you'll suffocate. Or you can be totally obliterated, wiped off the face of the earth. But despite these challenges, by mid-June, they'd managed to dig over 100 metres of tunnel. The German line was almost in reach. As they progressed, they supported the tunnel with timber walls and corrugated tin roofs. 50 yards into no man's land, the team continues to hunt for traces of this work. Yeah, see, on the top. Yeah, hear wood. Can you hear the wood? Listen. Yeah. Listen, 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 listen. There it is. There is the roof of the gallery, I hope. Look at that. That was the roof of the gallery. For a split second, a fleeting moment. <laughs> when you... It's all right, it's OK. Oh, dear, oh, dear, oh, dear. They found the sap. But to safely continue the hunt, they'll need to expand this hole. The biggest problem we have is these dreadful collapses, and it's because the clay down here is much sandier, so it shears off much more easily, which makes it very dangerous indeed. With the help of another digger with a longer reach, the hunt continues. But as the hole gets deeper and wider, spirits start to sink. Oh, that's it. Yeah, that... After two days, they've uncovered deposits of chalk, but there's no sign of the sap. We had it yesterday, just over there. We all saw that timber down at the bottom at about 20 feet. This is, this is even deeper, and there's nothing to see apart from complicated geology. Yeah. And it looks highly likely, from what we saw over there and from what we've got up there, that it's collapsed anyway. Yeah. It's another setback for the team's quest to get underground. But once again, a discovery at the eastern incline may have saved the day. What you got, Tony? Well, I thought it was, it was just a bit of a pump as it came out. This, yeah. is, this is the entrance that was blown in. And we started out just some rusty metal. But look at this beautiful metal. Perfect. It, it, it's huge. You know what strikes me? That metal is unlike anything else that we've seen on this dig. So I think we need to get Peter in and find out exactly what this is before we go any further. After days of digging, we may have finally found a secret weapon lost for almost a century. As Tony continues to uncover our piece of mystery metal, I've gone to find Peter. Oh, Pete, look at this thing. Unbelievable. I think it's all one piece. But... It's flame projector. Is it? Is it? There's no Is doubt it? of that flame projector here. Yeah. Why do you say that so quickly? I've never seen anything else like it, and I can almost recognise it from... I can see where it goes on the machine. You're kidding me. This I'm... is incredibly promising. Do we know of any others of these that are still in existence? I don't know of any part in any museum anywhere on Earth. Well done. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, Pete, I must shake your hand. I never thought, when you brought me on this project, I thought we were onto a wild goose chase, but this is unbelievable. Peter believes he's found a key part of the machine, but to help him identify it, he brings in Royal Engineer Steve Boylan. Steve, come and have a look Hi, at this. Hi, Pete, how are you doing? Give me your professional opinion. Like the engineers who first built this machine, Steve's an expert in handling dangerous liquids. 
Well, straight away, unlike some of the other finds, we can tell this is a lot better quality metal. This is almost gun metal with high qualities of nickel and chromium as well. But also, you can tell if it's, it's been professionally engineered and manufactured. Yeah. I think we're quite lucky to find such a distinctive piece, first of all. I originally thought this was one piece, but it's two, isn't it? Yeah. That's separate. I think that is a standard gate valve behind it. There it is. This yeah. one is part 280, um, which is this one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this one. that's looking at it from this angle. And then this one, which is 271. And that would be the last valve before the actual monitor. Listen, that's fantastic. Great. Thanks, Steve. Thanks okay, very much. no problem. According to Steve Boylan, this valve was the trigger. Once open, hundreds of litres of oil would race forward, causing the machine to rise up and punch through the soil. There was nothing like it on the Western Front. OK, put it this way. Oh, God, this is heavy. OK, I've got it. You got that? The teams found a key piece of this terrifying weapon. If luck is with us, the rest of it will be further down that incline under our feet. In the final hour... We've got a lot of work to do. The team races against the clock to find the tunnel. I'm stuck! Recover the flame projector. Anna, that's it, that's it. And kickstart the second part of this incredible project. It would be great to be able to see this thing actually firing. With the help of the Royal Engineers, they'll try to rebuild the most terrifying weapon of the First World War. Oh, here we go. Oh. Wow. A team of experts has gathered in northern France for a special expedition. We've got a lot of work to do. They've come to find a secret tunnel used in the bloodiest battle of World War I. Oh, God. It's getting more dangerous all the time. Recover a forgotten weapon of terror trapped inside it. Well done. That's it, that's it. And with the help of the British Royal Engineers... Good to go when you are. ..rebuild it. It was designed to instill the most horrific terror. Good grief! That's burning my face. Mamey, France. Historian Peter Barton has come to investigate a very special field. With him are battlefield archaeologists Tony Pollard and Ian Banks. It may look beautiful today, but don't let this idyllic scenery fool you. This was once one of the most dangerous places on the entire planet. In the summer of 1916, this was at the heart of the Battle of the Somme, the most infamous clash of the First World War. The battle raged across this entire area, but these particular fields are very special. We've come to find a secret tunnel that runs beneath this field. Called SAP-14, it stretched from the British front line to the very edge of the German trenches. It contained explosives that could shatter German defences, a secret hatch that delivered troops straight into the enemy line, and the most terrifying weapon of the war, the Livin's flame projector. They've had real trouble getting into the tunnels. And they've taken the timber out of the incline. What is that? We've had no indication of this thing continuing on. It's around here close, but this just is not it. But the finds are coming up by the dozen. What we found is a, a toothbrush. Vaseline. This is a French bayonet. It's flame projector. Is it? Is it? No is doubt it? that's flame projector, yeah. They found a key part of the projector, a valve that controlled the flow of oil to the head of the weapon. Once it was opened, Hundreds of litres of oil would race forward, causing the machine to rise up and punch through the soil. There was nothing like it on the Western Front. Yeah. OK. The team's convinced more of it remains entombed beneath their feet. Wow. After carefully removing it from the ground, they've taken it to the fines tent for a closer look. It's really cleaned up now, hasn't it? 
beautiful. We're still taking some clumps of dirt off it. We don't want to do too much to it, obviously, before the conservators get to it. It's hard to believe that it's practically 100 years old. It's in such good nick. So good, in fact, that if you look down there yeah. and I turn this, can you see the valve moving? <laughs> yeah, Opening absolutely. and closing? That's phenomenal, really. After almost 100 years in the ground, which says it all, really, about British engineering. Of course, now we've got this, it immediately asks the question, can we get any more of it? I'm hopeful that as we get into that in destroyed incline, we will find more pieces. With just five days left, Tony gets back to work at the eastern incline. From the war diaries, the teams learned that hours before the Battle of the Somme began, the projector was hauled into this staircase that led to the sap. But before it could be carried into firing position, a shell hit the incline, burying the weapon beyond recall. We've taken out the piece of the flame projector from what we believe to be the entrance of the incline down into the sap. And just beneath, we've encountered what looks for all the world like a wood-lined floor, which is sloping down, as we would expect, down under the ground toward the sap. So, sitting on this floor, I'm hopeful that we will encounter other pieces of the flame projector. As Tony continues to excavate the incline, I check in with Peter at the front line. They came in search of the sap and flamethrower, but couldn't resist excavating a stretch of this iconic trench. Peter, this is such a neat piece of archaeology. You've got the First World War trench there, and then obviously it would have continued in that direction and here and over there. What does it tell you about what life would have been like for the people who were guarding the front? It's a deeply evocative piece of archaeology. Here we have an armchair. It's only a sandbag to us, but it was an armchair to those soldiers. This is the only place you could sit in this trench. There's nowhere else to go. You'd have your feet inspected, you'd have your rifle inspected, you'd receive letters from home, you'd write letters from home, and you'd wonder when this damn war was going to end. So this was like their home, really, wasn't it? Yeah, this was your home, you kept it clean, and you knew this as well as your home. Here, for instance, you've got petrol tin. Wouldn't have carried petrol, though. That would have carried water. That's the only way you could bring water into the trenches. It very often tasted of petrol. Down here, you've got... That's a tin of jam. Probably plum and apple. Yeah, uh, astonishing. Tiny little slice of life, but a tiny little slice of thousands of lives. Back at the eastern incline, more of the floors revealed. Our piece of flame projector was on this step at the top on the level. Now, I would imagine, looking at the angle of this, that anything that was put on this, there's a good chance it's going to roll down the chute. So we may have, at the bottom of the incline, I'm not quite sure how deep, a whole pile of flame projector parts. So what we've been doing is we've brought the machine in and we're trying to catch at a deeper level, the incline coming down. But Tony's got another reason to be excited. This is now looking like our best bet to get down into the sap. Just keep our fingers crossed. With a key piece of the projector recovered, the team starts the second part of this remarkable project. We don't know what this thing looks like in action. And I think to complete the circle of this story, it would be great to be able to see this thing actually firing or something which resembled it actually firing. To kickstart the rebuild, Peter travels to Chatham, UK, home of the Royal Engineers. Today's generation of Royal Engineers come to learn how to clear minefields and build bridges. But in 1916, the curriculum contained some very different lessons. When they weren't learning how to dig trenches and tunnels, they trained with poison gas and flamethrowers. Almost a century ago, the inventor of our flame projector walked these very grounds. A recent Cambridge grad and brilliant engineer, his name was William Livens. What do we know about Livens? Uh, he joined up on the very first day that war broke out and said, I want to get into action. But he didn't get to do that, unfortunately. He came here to REHQ in Chatham 
where he was stuck in a signalling section. So he was just a kind of glorified messenger, really? Sort of, yes, yeah, sending messages by motorbike here and there or by telegram, and he was desperately frustrated. So what was the tipping point for him? Well, that happened on May the 7th, 1915, and that was the sinking of the Lusitania. And Livens thought that his fiancée, Elizabeth, was on that ship. He checked on the passenger list and there was her name, so he believed that she was one of the 1,100 who'd gone down with the ship. And at that very moment, he swore that he would kill as many Germans personally as civilians that had gone down on that ship. Three days later, he got a telegram saying she missed the boat. So when he found out she was still alive, did he withdraw that vow? He didn't. What was his plan to kill all these people? In one of these rooms around this square, he starts experimenting with poison gases and uh, flame projectors, of course. News of his inventions quickly spread. And in time, the 25-year-old was put in charge of Z Section, a secret unit tasked with building flamethrowers. The prototypes under development were death traps, just as likely to burn operators as intended targets. Convinced he could do better, Livens began to build the deadliest flamethrower in history. Unlike earlier models, this one could be secretly fired from a tunnel. 20 cylinders of compressed nitrogen forced the fuel towards the front of the machine. As pressure built, the monitor head rose up and punched through the soil. Torches lit the fuel as it left the nozzle. The result was a weapon of unimaginable terror and power. Now, with the help of the Royal Engineers, we'll try and make a working model in some of the very shops Livins might have used in 1916. To get started, Peter and Tony first pay a visit to the Royal Engineer who will be leading the rebuild of the flame projector. Staff Sergeant Steve Boylan. Steve, how do you feel about building a working model of what we found? Some of those pieces seem incredibly complicated. Are you intending to rebuild those? No, Tony, the, the, some of the parts we found were absolutely amazing. We're going to hopefully use modern components. It's quickly deployable, a lot lighter, but we'll still do the job. What kind of propulsion system are you going to use? We're going to use a centrifugal pump that will be driven by a diesel engine. It's a lot safer and a lot easier to control and manage. It sounds like this is the opposite of what you normally do with fuels. We spend 99% of our time trying not to set a light to fuel, but this one's going to burn, I'm sure of it. And after all, Peter, we are the Royal Engineers. We can do anything. As Steve gets to work on the machine, Tony and Peter head back to site. They now have just days to finish the dig. At the eastern incline, efforts to find more parts of the projector continue. Hollow. That's hollow only. Gary, can I come down? Of course you can, yeah, yeah. yeah. There is a little void underneath. What they thought was the floor may, in fact, be the roof. It's outside. Oh, wait a minute. There's... There's a wall here as well. If part of it's still intact, they may have discovered a time capsule from June 1916. Oh, that's well. It is. It is. Rope. Rope. The head of the monitor was lifted with rope. Do you remember on the photographs? Yeah, yeah. It had pulleys. Yeah. In case the hydraulics failed, the monitor head could be raised with a pulley. That's a great sign. Well, we've got some digging to do, haven't we? Yeah. They've uncovered the shattered top of the structure and are crossing their fingers that the rest of it's beneath their feet. With the help of the Royal Engineers, they start to uncover the incline. The epicenter somewhere here, yeah. isn't it? This chap's filling the barrow faster than I can move it. What they find is astonishing. 30 feet of shell-blasted roof and walls. A very nice job, boys. They hope more of the projector will be trapped inside and that it might finally lead to the sap. Well, this is really exciting. And look how it's twisted. It's just like a big roller coaster. 
Yeah. It's tremendously yeah. steep. I'd, I'd rather be carrying a, a flame projector down it than bringing it back out again. Yeah. We've got a lot more work to do in here. We're nowhere near the bottom yet. No. As work continues to uncover the incline, I head over to the finds tent. The finds are really starting to come up now, aren't they? And we've got some really nice little insights into what they were doing in their downtime. Um, much of it appears to be related to alcohol, um, which is something that, as archaeologists, we can understand fully today. We've got a Johnny Walker whiskey bottle here, which was a real favourite of the British soldier, bottle made in Kilmarnock in Scotland. Cork's still in it. We've got a French Perno bottle. And let's not forget, we've got both French and British on this site, French first and then the British taking over. And I think my favourite is this champagne bottle, which shows some degree of high living, which still has the label visible on it. What about the smaller finds, Tony? Well, this is lovely. This was in the frontline trench, and it's a daddy's sauce bottle, brown sauce, which is still my source of choice. So men sat there overlooking the Germans and slapping this stuff on their bully beef. Then we have a beautiful little inkwell, which is very emotive, I suppose. Brings, brings to mind the, the image of the, the soldier writing letters home from the front line. Beautifully made, um, and it's got these little grooves in it. And the reason they're there is you can simply rest your pen. Mm. What's that intriguing little thing? Well, this is actually my favourite find from the entire dig, believe it or not. And it came from the incline entrance, and it's a little love heart carved from a pebble. And some soldier, whether he intended to give this to his girlfriend or wife or whatever, um, lost it. But a beautiful little thing and brings to mind so many other things than war. With just four days left, efforts to find the bottom of the incline continue. They hoped it would lead into the sap, but after chasing it for 40 feet, it's not looking good. That's the end. That is the end. So there's nothing, no more timber beyond there? No more timber. They've recovered everything from here. It looks that way. Everything except for this incline has been stripped by the tunnelers and the saps caved in. Everything they could get into, yeah. they've robbed. One part of this project has come to an end. It is disappointing not to be able to get into the original galleries, the original tunnels. But another is still very much alive. We do have much, if not all, of our eastern incline, which presumably within it may well have more of our flame projector. That's it, sir. It's folded up like a book as the, the explosions knocked it, knocked it through, so anything that was in that incline is still in there. But the team's been given one more chance to get a glimpse of the tunneler's world. Word of the dig has spread, and we've been invited to Boozencourt, a village 12 kilometres north of our site. During the war, tunnelers expanded medieval catacombs that run deep beneath this church. Sealed off for years, the team's been given special permission to enter. Armed with a mechanical canary that will monitor oxygen levels, they head off into the world of the tunnelers. It's like a concrete bunker, this I've stuff. No, I've no idea how deep it is. In the weeks before the Battle of the Somme began, Allied soldiers took refuge here. Far below ground, they were safe from German shells as they waited to enter the battle. Is it getting narrower and lower? It's definitely getting lower. At the edge of the catacombs, they reached the point where the tunnelers would have begun their work. Good choice of directions here, Tony. Oh, toss it away. Oh, we go left or right here, it's down there. Should we try this way? Yeah. Okay. Careful on that drop. Okay. Let's step, step. These chambers were carved through hard rock common to this region. Although our sap was dug through clay, this is what most of the tunnelers working on the Somme would have faced. There's lots of look at this. There's niches. Inscriptions and all sorts on the side here. There's loads of graffiti. Yeah, there's graffiti everywhere. There is. 1916. It's everywhere. It's, it's, it is everywhere. Some there's a all... Canadian machine gun company here. Canadians? Corporal S.R. Seabrook, 436128, 1st Canadian Machine Gun Company, 
Leto McMinnville, I think, 1916. That's amazing. Absolutely astonishing. Is that detector behaving itself? It is. It's still chirping, yeah. Good. Nails in the wall for putting kit on. Look at that. There's tin cans everywhere. Everything beneath the grass is frozen in time, yeah. isn't it? Everything. Oh, look at this. Is it a bed? It's fairly... Very weird. probably, yeah, yeah. Should we go through here? Yeah. Look, it just that's... goes on and on and on. Helmets were a good idea. <laughs> yeah, a pair of boots. Wow. Is that archaeology? That's history. <laughs> I know we didn't get into our own, but coming into here is it's just special, isn't it? It's a time capsule. Uh, it leaves you breathless with admiration for those men, doesn't it? Their war was digging through this stuff. That's 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Amazing. But they had to do it. Yeah. It had to be ready for the 1st of July. Although they didn't get underground on site, they've managed for a few incredible moments to walk in the footsteps of the tunnelers. Back at the site, the hunt for more of the projector is in real trouble. Last night, the area was pounded by a ferocious storm. Oh, dear. Yes, uh, quite a turnaround. Um, well, in there, we reckon there's about three foot of water. That's good. I'm rowing the right boots for this. So the site, really, today is unworkable. And it's Wednesday today, and we've got to be out by Friday. Definitely got to be out by Friday. There are no options there, and we still have some key tasks to do by then. What's key? What's vital? What do we need to have done by the time we go? The key, the key task is getting into that incline. We've exposed it very carefully. We hope within there we're going to find more evidence for our flame projector, but we need the conditions to be able to do that. As we wait for the site to dry out, I head back to Chatham to check in on the rebuild. Steve and some of his students from the Royal School of Military Engineering are about to test it with water. This really is quite a big moment for me because everyone spent so much time and trouble researching the flamethrower and they've pinned all their hopes in it. And now, for the very first time, I can see it. Steve! Hi, Tony. Wow, this is something, isn't it? Thanks very much. I'm glad you like it. I didn't say that. I said it's something. <laughs> it is something, yeah. The one thing that strikes me is quite what a large area it all covers. It certainly is. It's our first trial with the bits and pieces with the water. And we've got a few things here we might not actually use on the day, but we're going to trial a lot of it, see what works best, and then move that forward for the uh, final shot with the fuel. So what is it that you want to try and find out today? It's the first time all of this has been put together like this. We want to see that it works. We want to see that it pumps. We want to see that it produces pressure. Peter, come over here for a minute. This is your baby. <laughs> How are you feeling? I'm just delighted to be working with people who know exactly what they're doing. I mean, this is an absolute monster. Yeah. Livin's machine was powered by compressed air, but our rebuild will be driven by a massive diesel engine. We've got a, a big mechanical pump here, basically. This is what's going to take the fuel, it's going to suck it out of our tanks, it's going to move it through the pipes and the valves, and it's going to move it onto our larger pump there. We're going to bring it all out from these tanks here, basically, one at a time. So these four tanks will hopefully represent our four shots. These bags will soon hold fuel, but today they're filled with water. 2,000 litres of it per minute is about to be sucked from these bags and thrown towards the nozzle at 15 metres per second. Are we ready to go? I think we're ready to go, Tony. We're certainly ready to, uh, for our first shot, if you want to see what it looks like. Let's go for our first shot. I'll okay. get the other way. With the all clear, it's time to see this thing in action. Whoa, there it goes. Very impressive, Steve. Yeah. See how it's just bursty it's in the air. Yeah, well, we're getting slightly showered here, aren't we? <laughs> quite a strong headwind in the minute as well. Yeah. 
2,700 litres in a matter of seconds. So that's going to give off some flame and some heat. Wind it down. Even though we weren't in the direction of the wind, we were still being covered with a lot of spray. But imagine how dangerous that would have been to the lads behind it. Especially you feel that mist on your skin. If yeah. that's, that's oil or flame, it would have been horrendous. Wasn't it? it really would have been. With the fuel, it's going to be absolutely essential that the wind is in the right direction. Otherwise, we're not going to be able to use it at all. Certainly, and that's what we want to avoid on the day. But you're going to have a fiddle with it. We're going to have a fiddle, a tinker with it, and see what we can do. Well, as tests go, it wasn't bad, but when I come back, it'll be the real thing. When we left yesterday to check on the rebuild, the site was a mess. The team believed that more of the projector can be found at the bottom of the incline, but to get inside, they need to remove the water. Gary, why have you turned the pump off? We've got to a point where it's just slurry. So rather than clog the pumps up with slurry, what we're going to do, we're going to form a human chain and just bucket this out so it's out of our way. OK. So, with just two days to go, they decide to roll up their sleeves... ..and get a first-hand taste of the infamous mud of the Somme. Now we're cooking on gas. Uh, and so we've resorted to the old bucket line. Try not to kill him, Kel. Try not to kill him. <laughs> Chain's broke down for some reason. Chain's broken down. We'll just get, send all these empties down now. Sound like you're in the pub, Pete. Send all the empties down. <laughs> <laughs> Two more, chaps. <sighs> Empty. OK. Well done. Put a bit of colour in your cheeks. Well in, big fella. Well done, Kel. It's back to the university for me. As we prepare for the final push, Peter and I head to the end of the sap. By July the 1st, 1916, it was over 100 metres long. We taped out the line of the sap, and you can see it comes right to the German line. So beneath our feet here, there would have been two board mines, and they were blown on the moment of zero, 7.30 a.m., 1st of July, 1916. And what was the effect of that? It blew in two German dugouts, possibly containing machine guns, a sniper's post, and it would have wrecked their front line completely. So what it really did was neutralise this part of the line. Immediately after that, from this point here, out popped a party of men from the manhole and went straight into the German trenches. So anybody in other dugouts coming up will see there's British soldiers here. What, what can you do? Were there many casualties? The company who attacked from our line over there, a minute and a half away across no man's land, had no casualties at all. This seems to fly in the face of everything that we've always learned about the Somme. Was it a fluke? Well, it appears that wherever the saps were used with ingenuity, there is a correlation between success and the use of saps. So all the way down the south here, where they had clever and intelligent use of these saps, flamethrowers, mortars, machine guns, mines, they gained all their objectives. Elsewhere, nothing. By the end of July the 1st, the Allies had grabbed the German front line and raced deep into enemy territory. For the first time since the war began, Mamey was in Allied hands. To the east, attacks were launched from almost a dozen saps driven by the 183. Peter has learned that this is where the Livin's flame projector saw action that day. Hours before the battle, three were hauled into saps. Ours was struck by a shell, but the others made it into position. Just on the ridge over there where the two trees are, they've managed to get two in use. At 7.30 a.m., Livin's creation made its terrifying debut on the Western Front. It was really instilling dreadful terror. The machines worked, and the German line was hammered by a terrifying wall of flame. Once that flame was burning across here, it drove the Germans into the dugouts, and when they came up again, the trenches were full of British troops. 
Within hours, kilometers of enemy territory and hundreds of Germans were in Allied hands. It was one of the most successful operations of the war to date. Following the battle, Horace Hickling, the architect of the tunneling scheme, posed with his men in captured German equipment. So what Hickling put into place here to assist those men was totally unexpected. That's the key. Surprise, surprise, surprise. But it seems to me that you're making a big assumption, which is that the difference was the saps. But there must have been other factors at play. Were there less Germans on this part of the line than elsewhere? Yes, that has been said, but that, of course, begs the question, why invest so much time, effort and ingenuity in a place where you think it's more weakly held? Why not place it somewhere else? Why not put it at a massive strong point further north? As evidence, Peter points out the fate of the 9th Devonshires, an Allied unit that went into battle to the right of our field. Despite attacking along the same stretch of front, at 7.30 a.m. they were torn to pieces while trying to cross no man's land. The key difference between their field and ours, no saps. But Peter believes the most tragic misuse of the saps occurred in the northern sector of the front. Over 3,000 metres of tunnels had been driven in the weeks before the battle. To learn more about what happened here, Peter and I head north to visit the battlefield near Serre. We must be, what, 10 miles away from where we're excavating. Were there saps all the way along this line? There were. We are 10 miles away, exactly, yes. And there were saps everywhere, all the way from our site to this point here. We're in front of Serre, and this is the northern boundary of the Somme battlefield. And what happened here? Probably the worst disaster of the entire battle. There were saps here for the infantry to use, but they attacked over the top. Those saps were not planned to be used by those troops. The front line was not captured, and no man's land was a carpet of British dead and wounded. It was a disastrous day. I don't understand. Why was the decision made not to use the tunnels? It seems that the choice was the divisional commanders. And the commander here thought that the artillery would do the job for him. So he said, right, we will use these tunnels, but only after we've captured the German front line, and then we can use them for safe communication. So he didn't put into place any mines, no machine guns, no flamethrowers, certainly. It's ironic, really, isn't it? All these guys were coming out of their trenches, and underneath their feet was their salvation. That's absolutely right. They could have used those tunnels with a bit of thought, with a bit of communication, with a bit of ingenuity, and with less confidence in those guns. They were there for them. It's a tragedy. The disaster was repeated throughout the northern sector of the front. Within 24 hours, 60,000 men were dead or wounded. Among the hardest hit, the 1st Newfoundland Regiment. 780 men went into battle that morning in this field just south of Serre. 68 reported for duty the next day. After the 1st of July, what happened to the whole notion of digging tunnels under the no-man's land? They took it up immediately. By the 3rd of July, they'd already put into place schemes for more saps, a hell of a lot more saps, on the places where they'd not made any gains. And I'm talking about quadrupling the number. So they instantly realised that the mistake they'd made on the 1st of July by not using them properly in the north. In the next battles in 1917, at Vimy Ridge, at Arras, at Messines, they put in massive Russian sap schemes in order to achieve exactly the same as they wanted to do here on the 1st of July to help the infantry get into the first line of German trenches and move on from there. As day 14 comes to an end, they've now got just hours to get inside the incline and find more of the flamethrower. The entire project has come down to the wire. At the bottom of the incline, the team's ready to start removing the timber in hopes of finding more of the projector. Whoa. So you've got the sling round it now? Yeah, what we're going to do, we're going to try and see if we can sort of extract it like you would a tooth, you know, yeah, bring it, yeah. pull it straight out. Hey, Gary, do your wasp. On you, devil. I'm not letting you anywhere near my teeth. 
It's coming now, Gary. Oh, he's got it, he's got it, he's got it. Lift, 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 lift. Oh! Oh, fantastic. As they remove more timber, they spot a void in the clay. What is it, Gary? Is it metal? It's quite substantial. It's about eight to ten inches wide yes. in diameter. Looks like it could be a tank. Oh, boy. It could be the firing tubes. There were seven of those. It sounds hollow. Gary, do you think you're going to have to extend that hole, or do you think you can get it out as it is? We're definitely going to have to extend the hole, and there's a flange on the end of it. That's... There's a flange right, right on the end of it. Exactly. Stands out about that far. Correct. <laughs> correct. He knows it's correct. He can feel it. <laughs> <laughs> He's never felt one before. <laughs> Nobody's felt one for 90 years, Tony. Peter hopes they've found another key piece of the machine, a firing tube where they actually held the fuel and the piston pushed the fuel through it into the firing head. If we have got what we think it is, that's going to make the whole dig worthwhile, isn't Completely. it? Completely. But there's a catch. The rains destabilised the banks, and they can't risk digging here for long. Giving us a bit of concern on this side, so we, we don't want to waste too much time. Just be careful, Mike. With time running out, they launch a final effort to retrieve the piece. It would be fantastic to get that one out. Ah, oh, thanks, Josh. Oh, well. Nicely done, sir. It's like a, uh, an ancient cannon coming out of the seabed. Give him room. Okay, that's it. We'll set it there. Can you identify the part? I can. Part number three, two, one. Projection pipe, plane. Hey, Fenito. Amazing, really, given what we faced this morning. I never thought we'd get here. It's incredible. Well done, Pete. Well done, guys. With the artefact out of the ground, there's just one last job to do. Royal Engineers, come on. And the honour is given to a very special part of the team. You there? It's rather touching, that. 90 years ago, their predecessors brought that through the trenches and carried it down. And now it's Royal Engineers right, from 2010 yes, carrying it out. Double, then. Makes you feel rather tearful, in a way. It really does. Think. As day 15 comes to a close, it's time to end this remarkable excavation. As far as I'm concerned, that's mission accomplished. We've got various pieces of the machine. We've exposed and recorded the structure. We understand what's happening with it as far as we can. So as far as I'm concerned, I do not see the need to go into that any further. Don't you want to get further in, Peter? I'd love to, but uh, I agree with Tony. I think, uh, I think we have found what we need, and we've come up with the goods we have found the parts of this extraordinary, unique machine. They may exist nowhere else on Earth. With the excavation over, it's time to head back to Chatham. For the first time in history, we'll try to fire a rebuild of a massive First World War flamethrower. As the dig continued, the Royal Engineers have been hard at work on the rebuild. While they'd never used such a horrifying weapon in battle, it's finally ready for the test range. It's a lot of work going into it, though, isn't it? It's much bigger than it was before. This construction is very sturdy. Thick, heavy pipe, um, an I-beam behind it, and we certainly don't want this to move. So how are you going to ignite the fuel as it comes out through the nozzle? We've got two welding torches and we've got the flames crossed, and we're going to fire the fuel through them flames. You've got a new nozzle as well. That's tighter, is it, than the other one? Yep, we've got a nozzle on there. It's very true to, uh, to Levin's original um, system. We've copied his original one, uh, and hopefully it'll do the job. That's the valve then, Steve. That's the fast-acting shut-off valve, yeah? 
Yeah, that's the fast-acting shutter valve. It's very key, it's operated by air, and its job is to slam shut the supply of fuel. Also to open it, but it's a key piece of equipment. This dead man's switch is critical to the team's safety. After each firing, this valve will be slammed shut, instantly cutting off the fuel. This should keep the flame from travelling down the pipe and igniting 5,000 litres of fuel. If it fails, the entire site could go up. But it's just one of the problems Steve's facing. I'd be embarrassed if we can't set a light to it. If we can't add light, uh, you know, a lot of kerosene with welding torches, we haven't done our job. So, sleepless nights for you, then, for the past few weeks? I've got a bet on it. I'm confident it'll go, but that would be my biggest worry, doesn't it, Guy? Oh, good luck. Front gate, Corden, can you please close the gate? Over. After all this work, the team's anxious to see this thing in action. This is from gate, Corden, uh, gate closed, over. But once again, Mother Nature's refusing to cooperate. Hmm. This wind must be quite on the edge. The wind's picked up. And if it gets any worse, they'll have to cancel the test. But that's the thing about these weapons, gas and stuff. The wind's got to be in the right direction. All the conditions have got to be right. Finally, as it dies down for a moment, Steve decides to go for it. What are they using here? Oxyacetylene torches? Yeah. It's a, it's a very, very peculiar feeling to be here. This has been in my head day and night for years. It's as if everything up to now has been academic, and now it's become something very different. Steve hopes these torches will ignite the fuel as it rockets from the nozzle. I can feel my blood pressure rising. <laughs> but he's not sure if it'll work. The jet of fuel may simply blow the torches out like candles. Moving to increase his odds, Steve's decided to go with a shot of pure kerosene. It burns easily, but there's one drawback. At this volume, it may turn into a giant ball of burning gas and not a controlled burst of flame. With this valve open, there's no turning back. There we go. Right. Whoa. Whoa. Oh, oh. That's astonishing. Feel the heat. Stand back, Tony. Oof. That's exactly like the photographs. God, that is Good horrific. grief. That is horrific. That's burning my face. Yeah. Even at a safe distance, the heat's tremendous. We'll burn off the world. Good Lord. Wow. That's exactly like the photographs. Oh, oh God. Smoke. Brings tears to your eyes, doesn't it? I'm... That was very uncomfortable. That is horrific. Incredibly, it's worked. But now they want to see if they can get it closer to the real thing. In 1916, Livins added diesel to his fuel. The diesel's in there to give it extra thickness and carry, oh. and also to make sure it stays alight when, it's, when it reaches the German trenches. So some of it's alight as it's going over yeah. there. It lands in the trenches, and then it catches fire, so whoever's in the, the trenches... If they can get a mixture of diesel and kerosene to ignite, this is as close to the original as anyone's ever going to get. Talk, you can go in you are. Oh, dear, dear, dear. Wow. With the added diesel, the results are even more incredible. Getting afterburn with the gas. That's really exciting, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it is. Oh. Oh. Leg on my eyebrows. Dear God Almighty. Wow. 
extra bit, extra diesel, you see what that does. That's exactly what he wanted to achieve in 1916. Anything the oil landed on which would burn, would burn. Well, everything is. So there's no escape from that. I feel my lips are burning. With the test a success, it's time to dismantle the projector forever. Well, I think the, the sapphire should be very proud of themselves, don't you? It's a great job, isn't it? Amazing. I'm surprised by the actual heat coming off of it. It is quite a frightening object. I think one of the lessons we've learned this afternoon watching this firing is how effective this weapon would have been. We've seen through the archaeology how good the trenches could have been at protecting you from machine gun fire and even to a degree from artillery. But the thing with the flame projector is it's, it's delivering flame down on top of you. And what is supposed to be a means of defence effectively becomes a death trap. For Peter, it's given him a first-hand view of a war he's only seen in photos. The most impressive thing was to see a moment in time, or a few moments in time, of the First World War in colour. And that's what we got here today. Every image you look at is black and white, but today we could replace the colour in those amazing archive images. We can see exactly what this weapon would have done. It's also highlighted the engineering feat pulled off by the machine's inventor, William Livins. Within 25 weeks, it's gone from the page, the first pencil sketches on a page, to being deployed on the Somme. So that's devising, designing, building, testing, training, transporting, rebuilding, and using it on the 1st of July, 1916. That's an unbelievable achievement. But despite its performance on July the 1st, his invention would be used only twice more in battle. As the war grew more mobile, his massive projector became obsolete. You needed very specific conditions to use a weapon like this. The front had to be static, and once it started moving forward, there was very, very few opportunities. The advance had to stop for you to reuse it. As the war dragged on, Livins continued to develop weapons. In 1918, three years after making his vow to avenge the Lusitania, he returned home to his wife. He didn't stop designing, but one of the most bizarre things about this really bizarre life is the next thing he designed was nothing to do with weapons. It was an electric dishwasher. We came in search of secret tunnels. But in the end, we found so much more. After moving a mountain of dirt, we stood in the front line of the Somme, found key pieces of a top secret weapon, and for a few moments saw the First World War in vivid, terrifying color.